Hi everyone, I'm Naomi Thiden. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Illinois Chicago and affiliated with the Minnesota Population Center. Our first um, we're our session today is community context. So I'm going to introduce everybody who is going to um, be speaking at this session. So our first talk is called Sundown Towns and the Contemporary Racialized Organization of Space. David Rigby will be presenting. David, give a little wave, put a name to a face. Um, David received his PhD in sociology at UNC Chapel Hill and is currently a postdoc at Duke University. Um, David says that nobody in North Carolina is happy to learn that he has attended both of those schools. Um, but if anybody here is from North Carolina, please just reserve judgment for later. David's work focuses on the ways that historical practices of racial violence and control provoke changes in institutions and cultures that persist across time, shaping inequality, specifically vulnerability to state violence and the impact of these historical processes on population health disparities. Next, we'll have the collective role of person, place, and policy in high quality Medicare home health use. And our presenter will be Dr. Shekinah Fashaw-Walters. Dr. Fashaw-Walters. Dr. Fashaw-Walters is an assistant professor in health policy and management here at the University of Minnesota. As a health services researcher, her program of research focuses on understanding the inequality, inequities in aging while elucidating and explicitly naming racism as a fundamental determinant of health inequities within post-acute and long-term care. And our last talk of this session will be the great resignation was caused by the COVID-19 housing boom. Gain Lee up here. We'll be presenting Gain as a fourth year finance PhD at the University of British Columbia. Before joining UBC, he worked as a pre-doctoral research associate at Yale School of Management. His research mainly focuses on housing markets, behavioral finance, and empirical asset pricing. So we have a good group. And David, you ready? Where am I looking for time? Okay, thanks. No, that's all right. Well, uh, hello, thank you all for being here. It's an honor to be part of this uh, conference looking at the role of place in uh, well, health and well being. And this uh, paper is looking at specifically uh, place and social context and history. Uh, thank you to Naomi for serving as session chair. Uh, my name is David Rigby, and my collaborators on this project, Mike Esposito, Hetty Lee, and I, are looking at whether historical sundown town practices that were designed to exclude or restrict the movement of those racialized as non-white from public spaces long ago, uh, continue to shape the way that people access public space and resources today. Along with a growing body of his work on historical legacy studies that describe the long run effects of historical racial violence, we're gonna argue that historical racial violence and social control can bring about um, changes in institutions and cultures that persist in shaping communities and organizing contemporary experience. So here we're focusing on the impacts of sundown towns, which encompassed a set of legal and conventional practices that uh, sought to restrict the mobility of those racialized as non-white, and in practice were often marshaled to restrict the mobility of Black residents or Black people or to prevent them from occupying spaces that were intentionally constructed and reserved for whites. Um, in our data, we have examples of sundown policies that were codified in law, as well as signs like the one on this slide that were posted in public places, and then um, informal practices of exclusion uh, that, were, that helped to construct and maintain white public spaces. So for information on historical sundown town status, 
The data that we rely on is uh, collected by James Lowen. And these data have now been expanded using a crowdsourced information on the exclusionary practices um, thought to in places thought to have once been sundown towns. Um, like a lot of data on historical racial violence, these aren't comprehensive. Um, and because of the fuzzy nature of the data generation process here, there's some level of measurement error. Uh, and for this reason, we think that our analysis reflects a conservative estimate of impact of, of a, a sundown town histories. Um, for data on how people are moving around in public spaces today, we rely on safe graph, um, cell phone telemetry data uh, for the entire US throughout the year of 2019. Uh, this data set is structured in a way um, uh, that inclu includes an exhaustive list of points of interest of different kinds uh, paired with uh, census block groups. Uh, and so the unit of analysis is a point of interest uh, census block group dyad that records every block group in a particular area from which at least one to four unique visitors traveled to a point of interest in, a, in 2019. So this data is structured uh, around these dyads and for privacy concerns, these, datas, these data are censored and truncated and they don't include uh, inf identifiable information about individuals that are tracked, um, except importantly, the imputed uh, census block group where uh, Safecraft says people live. So this allows us to track how many people are going from the block groups where they live to, uh, in this case, public parks. Okay, so the low and sundown town data are publicly available. Um, so this information is available at the Tuguli website that's maintained at the University of Michigan. And these data mostly consist of a list of names of sundown towns with limited data like uh, state name, county name, some limited historical data, maybe uh, popu historical population counts, and then a code for the level of confidence that the historians that collected this data have that a place used to be a sundown town. So there's a lot of challenges involved in aligning these historical place names with spatial data that's amenable to the type of analysis that we uh, do here. Um, these data include uh, 2,400 places that have been identified with some level of confidence of, as having been formerly a sundown town. And these, have these places have different levels of geography, um, cities, counties, regions, geographic, um, yeah, uh, regions like the UP in, in Michigan. <clears throat> so after we get this list of place names, uh, we clean them from, we get these uh, names from the Tougaloo website, we clean them, we're able to find a match pretty simply for about 1800 of these uh, places that are identified as sundown towns. And then there's about 540 places that we can't find a simple match and census place uh, uh, data sets. So we prepared these place names to merge with census data by identifying the census block groups that constituted each of these places so that we can merge these with census data and with our cell phone data. And for the 540 kind of difficult cases um, for which we couldn't find simple matches, we search for place names across different levels of census geography and we verify matches um, using available details and archives. And when possible, we find shape files uh, online for these places in uh, sources like OpenStreetMaps or local government sites. And the, decision, the decisions that we make and how to assign spatial boundaries to these historical places are gonna be important for our, our model estimates because you know, these decisions about how to assign these boundaries impact how many geographic units are, are treated as being a sundown town, right? Um, for example, uh, this Lowen data records that the San Fernando Valley here in California was has a, hi a history of being a sundown place. And I found a shape file for this um, on the LA County website. And in 2019, the San Fernando v Valley included 922 census block groups. Um, in contrast, here is Old Homo Sasa, Florida. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, in, uh, we weren't able to find a shape file for, for some of these smaller rural areas, but we were able to find place centroids. And so we had to come up with a, with a rule for how to determine which you know, areas uh, in these, these small rural areas to assign treatment status. 
and we decided to uh, generate a one mile uh, radius around these centroids and then to include as treated every census block group that's at least 50% within that one mile radius. But in Old Homosassa, Florida, there's no block group that's within at least 50% within that, that radius. And we don't want to drop it from the data. So we just um, included anything that intersects the radius. Uh, and contrast again, here is um, Keeneville, Illinois, which is in the second most populated county in Illinois. And if we draw around the place centroid, we couldn't get a shape file, a uh, uh, circle of five mile radius, then we get uh, 219 census block groups that are treated that we would assign sundown town status, right? So uh, in contrast, if we do a one mile radius, we get only seven census block groups. So this is kind of the nitty gritty of how to decide how to turn this list of place names into a spatial data set that is amenable to analysis. And unclear why I included that, sorry. <laughs> uh, all right, so after transforming these sundown place names, to spatial data with uh, place boundaries into a new data set that we can use to analyze contemporary effects of these histories of racial violence. Uh, we uh, suspect that sundown town practices are gonna shape contemporary access to and use of public space through two different major mechanisms. This is a map of by census block group, the um, black population size um, projected underneath a map of the boundaries that we generated for places that you that have a history of being a sundown town. And so the first mechanism that, through which we think that this history of sundown status impacts contemporary access to space is through the segregationist historical pathway where partly due to these historical exclusionary practices, black people are less likely to be concentrated near or in towns that were once sundown towns. And thus they have less routine access to the parks that are located in these places that have these histories. And um, there are a disproportionate number of parks that are concentrated in these areas. Uh, and then the other mechanism that we're gonna focus on today is, uh, um, is the racialization of space. And so we think that sundown towns exert durable impacts on the contemporary use of public parks through a racialization of space through a process by which these exclusionary practices help to crystallize a collective understanding of some spaces as white spaces and some spaces as black spaces in a way that has durable impacts for the way that people experience these spaces and the way that institutions control these spaces. All right, so we're gonna model the association between contemporary use of public space and historical sundown towns uh, using a Bayesian multi-level negative binomial framework. And importantly, this model allows the effect of historical sundown town to vary across locality. And so this model allows us to assess whether a park's history as a sundown town location predicts how racialized communities interpret and use that space today. And we include an offset for uh, block group population size to convert these estimates to rates. So the model estimates and the figures that I'm about to show you um, should be interpreted as the expected number of visits to a particular park per 1,000 block group residents among predominantly black communities across the US uh, using 2019 cell phone data. So this figure um, shows the predicted visits per 1,000 block group residents from a hypothetical block group to a hypothetical park site um, throughout the course of a year according to our multi-level model. And these results are averaged across the entire country here. So the panel on the left shows uh, model predicted visits in 2019 from a predominantly black census block group to a park in an area that does not have a history of sundown town exclusions. And the panel on the right uh, shows park visitation behavior throughout the year from predominantly black communities oh, shit. Uh, <laughs> to a hypothetical park that was located within the bounds of a place that was a sundown town. And you can see that across throughout the year, there's stark differences. And this broadly um, aligns with our racialization of space hypothesis, uh, speeding up without speeding up too much. Um, I also wanna highlight that there's a lot of place-based heterogeneity in our findings. And so this is um, estimates for, for just St. Clair County, St. Louis, or St. Clair County, Missouri, which is outside of St. Louis, which is where I 
uh, was until about a week ago. And you can see that uh, in, in St. Clair County, in places that have a history of sundown town exclusions, it seems like um, people from predominantly black communities are, you know, visiting parks and accessing public spaces at much lower rates. All right. Okay. So all in all, our preliminary results point to a strong legacy of sundown towns on the contemporary organization and use of public space. I'm happy to talk about this more at length that the data preparation and, and modeling was, uh, you know, was uh, complicated. On the one hand, Suntown Towns appear to organize contemporary park accessibility among black communities through a long segregationist historical pathway where black folks tend not to live in places that were once sundown towns and also where many parks and public resources are located and concentrated in these areas that have histories of excluding black folks. And on the other hand, even among uh, black communities that remain in close proximity to places that have this history of exclusion, residents are significantly less likely to access these public places we still have a lot to do to tease out the specific mechanisms through which this history and this legacy um, imposes itself on contemporary outcomes. Um, we're doing mediation and analysis right now to look at how local policing practices impact how these legacies, you know, read forward to contemporary, uh, you know, use of space. So I look forward to talking to you more about this. Thanks, John. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm from the South and I was raised by a Baptist pastor. So when I say good morning, <laughs> I like response back. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Great, now you all can be quiet the rest of the time. That's fine. <laughs> so I'm talking about the collective role of person, place, and policy within uh, the Medicare home health environment. I appreciate that this talk came just before me because um, it already has you thinking about folks living in their homes. And one of the primary goals of home health is to be able to improve and maintain the physical functioning that we just talked about. So we've already had our land acknowledgement for today, but I'd also like to acknowledge those who were on my dissertation committee, which is where this work comes from. This is going to be your typical research talk, so we'll start with some background. And the background here I've kind of already given um, is really that Medicare home health is a growing industry. We see that Medicare is spending about $18 billion per year um, on this care. And during COVID-19, when folks decided that they didn't want to receive care in nursing homes because of uh, the different outbreaks that were happening, a lot of people started to receive more care within their homes as we open back up. Uh, there's a lot of geographic variability in how Medicare home health works and what it looks like from state to state um, and from space to space. And I'll share some more of that with you. And as I mentioned, one of the primary goals here is to maintain physical functioning. And one of the reasons this is so important is because about 89%, and I'm sure this is possibly growing, of older adults prefer to live and age within their own homes. And what we see from the data is that Medicare home health patients tend to be older, poorer, and sicker than other Medicare beneficiaries, which just speaks to the importance of understanding what the inequities are within this space um, and doing something about those inequities. And when we're talking about inequities in this space, inequities exist both in the outcomes such as physical functioning, it also exists in the quality and patient experience that folks have. And a lot of my work and what I'll be sharing with you today talks about how these inequities exist within uh, access or utilization of high quality home health services. So by way of background, we see, um, we've found that in through the literature that Black, Latinx, and low-income uh, home health patients are less likely to use high-quality home health agencies, which is why you see the space in between those various lines. Um, 
And we, we found that a large portion of this is related to the neighborhood context. So about 61% of the black white disparity, 77% of the Latinx white disparity, and 40% of the socioeconomic disparity is related to uh, neighborhood factors that we are able to measure and even those that we can't measure. And so this is why you see uh, the relationship between different neighborhood characteristics, such as the percentage of Black residents in a neighborhood or the social deprivation of a neighborhood as those more sort of adverse or disadvantaged characteristics increase, um, we see a decrease in the use of high quality services. And so then we might ask, why is this? And um, this is where understanding inequities really come into play. One of the ways we can understand inequities in home health is by taking a higher bird's eye view to understand the role of policy. And so some of my work focuses on the use and impact of colorblind policies. I won't take the time to really uh, define what colorblind policies are, but if anyone wants to talk about that further, I'm happy to. But specifically here, I look at public reporting as um, a colorblind policy. So the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services implemented public reporting, which is a five-star rating, works very similar to the five-star ratings that you see on Google for your favorite restaurants. One is a, I absolutely don't want to eat there. So in the case of home health, I don't want service from there. And five is I'll be on the waiting list because everyone's making reservations at this restaurant. So same thing in home health. And they did this in order to improve home health equity by creating competition between providers, but also um, by allowing consumers to be able to make better decisions with the information of um, quality and star ratings. However, in other settings, we've seen that star ratings sometimes have a differential impact by race and income. So the first part of this work was to look at is there a differential impact? And we can see from this slide that there is, there are disparities that exist, which we already talked about. And we can see um, that after public reporting starts, there is an increase in this disparity of accessing, accessing high quality home health agencies. So you see that by the yellow line, which represents the gap, the gap before the star ratings start. The red line represents the gap after the star ratings start. So you can see in that top set of bars that uh, the gap between high income versus uh, lower income beneficiaries grew after the introduction of the star ratings. We see that for those first three groups. And then what we see for our last two groups, um, Black and then American Indian, Alaska Native population, is that uh, the disparity somewhat decreases, but not very significantly at all. We also see this across different neighborhood types, uh, that there are differential changes in the access of high quality home health agencies. So there's actually an extremely large decrease in the use of high quality home health agencies within predominantly Latinx communities. So with all of that information, then the question becomes, is there a joint effect um, between place and individual characteristics. We see this impact of policy exacerbating disparities, but what is the role of being, for example, black in a predominantly black neighborhood or being black in a predominantly white neighborhood? How does that impact my access to care? So, in order to do this, I use a longitudinal difference and differences framework, which I'll kind of show you an equation of quickly. We use data um, from CMS, Medicare claims data, that includes the Medicare summary, uh, beneficiary summary file, which has different characteristics of each home health patient. Then there's the outcome and assessment information set, which um, is an assessment that's given to every single home health patient that uses a home health agency that is Medicare certified. We also have um, data from the Home Health Compare, which includes all of the star ratings um, from quarter to quarter. And then we merge in the American Community Survey um, as the neighborhood level characteristics that we will be looking at. And I should also note here that the OASIS data um, includes 
race that is self-reported or presumably self-reported, which we could also talk about a bit further. Um, I'm looking at all older adults here, age 65 and older, who are enrolled in Medicare and are living in the community using home health. I also exclude folks who are in congregate settings, such as assisted livings or group homes, because they have very little control over which home health agency serves them. My outcome variable is high quality home health agency use. So this is a home health agency that has greater than uh, or equal to 3.5 star ratings. And I should also note that I take the post star period, the star rating that a home health agency has, um, and I, I apply that to the pre-star period, obviously, because there are no star ratings in the pre-star period. However, I've done some work to see that quality really does not change that much over time and from quarter to quarter. And it's also important to note that the star ratings that we have um, for 2016 are actually reflective of data from 2015. So it's a more accurate picture, hopefully, of the quality that exists within a home health agency. My, uh, did I skip past? Yes. Independent variables, again, I'm looking at all racial and ethnic groups. This data is from around the entire country. So um, I take advantage of that to be able to look at each group that I could um, without grouping folks into an other category or something like that. I also look at income, individual level income. And I have to say that this is a really imperfect measure. It uh, takes into account whether you are Medicare, Medicaid, duly eligible, which oftentimes means you are lower income, but it is not a perfect measure. And then for neighborhood, I actually look at the zip code or ZICTA level. And this seems to make the most sense for this sort of work because agencies decide where they served based on the zip code that folks live in. My control variables include demographics, living alone, and then neighborhood, region, and rurality. So to evaluate if the association between the introduction of the home health agency five-star ratings and changes in high quality home health agency use by place-based factors varies by individual race and income, we estimate a, a race and income interactive models that test the interactive effects of individual characteristics and place-based factors while controlling and adjusting for the other characteristics that I just showed with to you. You can find this table um, in, in a journal article that I just published not too long ago in Millbank Quarterly. It's open access, so you could go and look at all of the characteristics that might be of interest to you. But essentially, what I like to show here is that um, the characteristics vary very little uh, before the star ratings and after the star ratings. So I did a uh, test of parallel assumptions and uh, for the diff and dip and that did whole. So this is essentially what we found. Um, here I present the percentage point change in high quality home health agency use following the five star ratings by patient income and neighborhood poverty status. And so non-low income, uh, patients are represented by the yellow. Hopefully you can sort of see it. Low income patients are represented by the blue. And um, along the X axis is the percentage or uh, is the along the X axis here is the quintile for categories of neighborhood poverty. And along the Y axis is the percentage point change in high quality home health agency use. And we see here um, the middle quintile through the highest is where we see significant, uh, significant differences in the change of high quality home health agency use. And in fact, in the fourth and fifth uh, quintiles is where we see non-low income patients uh, significantly increasing in high quality home health agency use, but low income patients significantly decreasing. We see very similar patterns here when we look at neighborhoods, uh, racial composition, so the predominance of a neighborhood along the bottom, um, and uh, non-low income and low income home health users are differentially impacted 
five star ratings in Latinx and minoritized neighborhoods. But what I like to call attention to is in our white and integrated neighborhoods, if we were to assume that these neighborhoods represent having more privilege, there really aren't differential um, experiences of accessing high quality home health agencies. And then I also do this by race and ethnicity. Um, I will make sure that these slides are shared with everyone so that you can see this in greater detail. But the biggest thing to call out here is that Latinx beneficiaries um, within these different uh, poverty quartile or quintiles uh, experience the lowest amount or the greatest decrease in access to high quality home health agencies. And we also do it by neighborhood types. Again, calling attention to predominantly white neighborhoods and integrated neighborhoods to see that there isn't very much um, of a significant difference between the groups. So the big take home here is that policy has a differential impact by neighborhood, by person, and also thinking about people in these different neighborhoods. I have some thoughts about how we could do better, but I'm out of time. So I will stop there. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Gen Lee. Uh, this is a joint work uh, with Jack for Vilkis. We are both from UBC. So let me first thanks for including uh, my paper, our paper in the program. The paper we are go I'm going to talk about today is called The Great Resignation Was Caused by the COVID-19 Housing Boom. Um, let me start by giving you some backgrounds of the Great Resignation. So in November 2022, Jerome Powell mentioned that uh, there is a current labor force shortfall of around 3.5 million people. So some researchers find that the participation gap, the shortfall of labor force, uh, labor force is mostly driven by the excess retirement of old Americans. So people are very interested in this pattern and, and call this decline in labor force shortfall as, um, as the great resignation. But the mechanism behind the great resignation is still a puzzle. Here are some well-known facts about the great resignation. So this figure shows the labor force participation rates uh, in different years relative to 2019. So each line here represents an age group. So let's look at the periods before 2019. As you can see that all age groups have experienced increases in labor force participation, but increases most prominent for the oldest Americans, the people over 65 years old. Then when the pandemic occurred in 2020, all age groups have experienced the declines in labor force participation. But again, you can see that the decline is most dramatic for the youngest and oldest Americans, as you can see from here. The next, when we move to 2021, 2022, all age groups have, exper have experienced the recovering in labor force participation, except for one group, which is the oldest American. So we wonder why those old Americans have never returned to the labor market. Here are three possible, re three possible reasons provided by Jerome Powell. The first reason is that the health threats from COVID-19 could prevent, prevent those old Americans from entering the labor market. The second reason could be that after leaving the labor market, those old Americans could be harder than those young people to find a new job again in the labor market. In other words, the cost of finding new employment is higher for those old workers. The third reason is that the gains in the stock market and the rising house price could contribute to the increase in wealth, which could facilitate the early retirement for some people. So in this paper, in our paper, we specifically focus on the rising house prices and see whether the increase in house price could explain the great resignation during COVID-19. So here is a summary of our paper. So in, in our paper, we use the individual level data from American community survey data, and we find that cross-sectionally higher house returns associated with strongly lower labor force participation rates. That is especially for old homeowners, specifically 10% uh, higher house returns associated with 
approximately 1% lower labor force participation. And that is for a six, five year, year old homeowner. And we do not observe the same pattern for the young and middle-aged people. And we do not observe the same pattern for home renters. Furthermore, we have done counterfactual analysis and show that if 2021 experienced the same house return as in 2019, then those old Americans would not, would, would not suffer a decline in labor force participation. So in other words, those old Americans would have very similar labor, labor force participation today. Here are some papers relevant to our uh, paper, but due to the time limit, I will not go through the details here. So next is the data and the specification. So in our paper, we use the American Community Survey data, and that is, and we main, mainly focused on three years from 2019 to 2021. So the ACS data provide us with rich household information, which includes the demographics, income, and housing characteristics. Our house return data comes from um, ZHVI and Freddie Mac. The ZHVI zero home value index is a county level house price index. And we use the index measured for single family residents and condos. This index has been smooth and seasonally adjusted. So we further complement our county level data with the MSA level, MSA level house price index. And that is from Freddie Mac. Here's our specification. So you can see that the dependent variable uh, in our specification is a dummy variable, which equals one if the household is in the labor force and zero otherwise. Um, however, I want to mention that our result is very robust when using other outcome variables such as employment status and self-reported usual hour works worked. Um, also, we have control for the county level characteristics and individual level characteristics, and those characteristics are very likely to be correlated with the outcome variable and also um, the house, house returns in the past. So controlling those characteristics could help us mitigate the omitted variable bias to an extent. More importantly, we add the house return, the county level house returns in the past 4.5 years. However, again, I want to mention that we have done lots of robustness tests and our re result is very robust when using other return horizons from one to 12 years. So with those information, we estimate these regressions separately for each five year age bucket and ownership status. So in other words, for each five year age bucket and ownership status, we'll get one B here. So the B here shows us the elasticity of labor supply to housing returns. Um, also, we have added the age fixed effects because we have five years in each age bucket. Lastly, uh, we classed our standard errors at MSA, MSA level. So here is the results. This is the estimated elasticity of labor force participation to house returns. Uh, so the top panel shows the uh, estimated elasticity and bottom panel shows the T statistics. The left panel shows the sample, shows the results using sample in 2021. And the right panel used the sample period from 2011 to 2021. So let, let's focus on the top left, top left panel first. So you can see that the blue line shows us the results using old sample in 2021. And you can see from the black line that for those old Americans, the people over 55 years old, if they experienced the high house returns in the past, then they would have lower, significantly lower labor force participation. However, this low labor force participation is not observed for uh, middle-aged people or young people. Furthermore, we have done subsample analysis and show that um, the low labor force participation is only significant for homeowners as indicated by the, uh, the blue line here, but that is not significant for home renters. Okay, so how to interpret our results? Let me take an example of a six, five year old homeowner. So you can see that from here, the negative coefficient of around neg of, uh, of, ne of, neg of negative 0 0.1 suggests that 
a 65 year old homeowner uh, who experienced a 10% high house return will have approximately 1% lower labor force participation. And then when we move from the left panel to the right panel, in which we use the sample from 2011 to 2021, we observe the very similar pattern in labor force participation. And you can see that there is very similar labor, uh, lower labor force participation for old people here. But what different is that the pattern in 2021 here is almost twice as the average across all years from 2011 to 2021. We have also examined other outcome variables um, like the employment rate and hours work, and we have found very similar patterns. So in the next part, uh, we were curious what the participation rates would look like if 2021 experienced the same house returns as in 2019. So to answer that question, we have done two things. First, we estimate coefficient in the 2021 regression as we have done in the previous graph. And then we put those estimated coefficients back to the specification and then we put the 2019 house returns rather than 2021 house returns back to the specification. Also notice that the 2019 house returns is lower than 2021 house returns. So this calculated labor force participation rate uh, is called counterfactual of labor force participation. And it, it will show us that how much the labor force participation will look, will, will be if 2021 experienced the same house returns as in 2019. So here is our results. So um, let's focus on the panel A first. The panel A is the result for all samples. Okay, so the X axis is the age and Y axis is labor force participation relative to 2019. So the red line, the red line shows us the actual labor force participation in 2021 relative to 2019. So from the red line, you can see that almost all age groups in 2021 have experienced the declines in labor force participation, but the decline is most significant for old people, for people over six years old. And then when we move to the pink line, the counterfactual labor force participation, you can see that it's very interesting that for young people, the counterfactual is almost identical to the actual labor force participation. But what more interesting is that the counterfactual of old people is far above the actual labor force participation rate. What does it mean? It means that if those old Americans experience the same house returns as in 2020, uh, 2019, then those old Americans would not suffer a decline in labor force participation. In other words, those old Americans would have very similar labor force participation today relative to 2019. And we have observed a very similar pattern for homeowners, but totally different result for home renters. So for the home renters, we do not observe the difference between the counterfactual and actual labor force participation, which suggests that the house returns do not change much the labor force participation for those old, for those home renters. So here is the detailed counterfactual numbers of the labor force participation, and it shows that the same result. So let me quickly go through the tables. The column two and column three shows us the actual labor force participation, and, the, um, and the, the column four shows that the counterfactual. And let's look at the red circle area for those uh, old people. So you can see that again, the counterfactual in 2021 is, all, is far above the uh, actual uh, labor force participation, but the counterfactual is almost identical to the 2019 labor force participation. So it shows us, shows us that without house price boom, then those old Americans will not suffer a decline in labor force participation. And in other words, they will have very similar labor force participation uh, relative to 2019 if there's no increase in house returns. So let me conclude my presentation today. So in this paper, we use the American Community Survey data, and we find that cross-sectionally high house returns associated with lower labor force participation for old homeowners. 
And this, we do not observe the same pattern for young and middle-aged people and no same pattern for home renters. Uh, the counterfactual analysis shows us that without house price boom, then those old Americans would not suffer a decline in labor force uh, participation, and they will have very similar participation today if they do not experience the huge increase in house returns. So that's my presentation today. Yeah, thanks so much. <laughs>